Hi, uh, my name is Andy Schmuckler. I'm doing a series of uh, YouTube videos to try to prevent, present uh, a better human story, uh, uh, a way of understanding ourselves and our, so our, our story and, and our challenges as a species that I think could have a beneficial impact. So uh, in the first of the videos, I indicated that uh, that's what drives me in my life right now as a 77 year old who has put a few things together that I don't think uh, are out there in the world where that kind of uh, coherent understanding might do some good. So I'm doing everything I can to, uh, and I, in that, in that uh, first video, I referred to uh, an idea that came to me in 1970 that uh, shook me to my bones that uh, basically dictated that the whole course of my life is going to be uh, very different. Where the, the first big piece of this better human story uh, came to me. Um, it's an idea I call the parable of the tribes. And that book back there um, came out from University of California Press in 84. It's still in print from SUNY Press, second edition. Uh, that is called uh, the parable of the, of the tribes, the problem of power and social evolution. So that's, that's the big idea that I, you know, that started it all. And, a lot of the new ideas also sort of uh, derive in a way from it, uh, as I've worked on it over the years. Some of, some of the rest of the better human story is not derived from that, but this one was the key. This one was the one that, like ever since that day, I, I have had the feeling that I had something really important that I needed to convey. And uh, uh, that's both a blessing and a curse, uh, I, I got to tell you. Um, but in any event, that day I saw something. Um, and, and I'm going to, in, in this uh, particular uh, YouTube video, um, I'm going to lay that out for you. Uh, I began that day... Uh, thinking I was going to go back off to graduate school at Yale in American Studies. I ended that day with a mission um, that's uh, basically given me purpose my whole adult life, but also made things challenging, let's just say. Um, so let me put the, uh, before I lay out that, the idea itself, uh, let me, uh, give you uh, a little bit of my personal story. Um, I kind of believe in, um, you know, when, when I was getting educated, uh, people who were thinkers um, were supposed to write as if they were sort of impersonal or um, from a Mount Olympus or uh, the word I. Um, was not supposed to appear uh, in, in our writings. Uh, I, I, I've been struck over the years that um, not only are there ideas, but that the ideas grow out of lives. Uh, and uh, that story is, I think, worth, worth um, including, in a sense, uh, because not only are we trying to find an objective, uh, valid understanding of things, but we also want to maintain a sense of uh, our humanity. Uh, that it, that it is, these, these, these words aren't handed down uh, on Sinai or <laughs> um, Olympus or whatever. Um, they're things that people came up with that grew out of their lives in some way. Um, that's just a whole different dimension about understanding the human world. 
So let me just tell a minute about uh, uh, this human's world and where this idea appeared, which is I graduated from college in 1967. Uh, the world was laid open uh, before me. Um, I you know, had any opportunity uh, that I wanted at that point. Um, and then my world got turned upside down. Uh, some of it was personal, like my father's death uh, a few months after I graduated from college. But then came 1968, uh, which was not just um, for me, but for a lot of the planet, uh, a time when there was a lot of upheaval. Um, and I found it very upsetting uh, and, and um, upset my sense of what kind of world did I live in. Um, I, I grew up under very fortunate circumstances that I kind of took for granted. I don't mean I personally so much as um, my generation of Americans. Uh, we'd won the war, we were having prosperity, we were the strong, strongest nation on the planet. Um, I mean, there were serious difficulties in Vietnam emerged, but anyway, 1968 was a year where uh, the war in Vietnam got very dark in the American mind. Uh, there was a Tet Offensive, um, which indicated that the war was much well, it was interpreted to mean that the war was really unwinnable. But um, then there was the assassination of Martin Luther King and the riots that took place uh, in, in black parts of uh, various American cities by uh, people who were justifiably enraged that one of their great men had been shot down because he was seeking to liberate them. And uh, then Bobby Kennedy got assassinated in Los Angeles uh, after becoming um, the clear uh, first choice uh, for a Democrat to become president and end the Vietnam War. And then there were the Soviet tanks rolling into Prague, Czechoslovakia to, uh, to put out the Prague Spring. Well, I was already shaken in a variety of ways, and not just my father's death, but uh, adding, oh, I, I, the, the same month of the Tet Offensive, I got my uh, draft notice, return to the Twin Cities and, and uh, uh, get inducted into the army by passing your physical. So um, that's another story. Um, I passed, I, I, I had a back condition which I called attention to, didn't have to. If, I had, if it was World War II, I wouldn't have called attention to it. Uh, but it showed up on an x-ray and the physician says, you know, what you've got is an automatic disqualifier, it became uh, one why. If we get into World War II, they'd use me. But my reason for it was that I was struggling to understand a, a kind of brokenness of which the war in Vietnam was part. And, and uh, I did what I never, you know, pre, you know, could have imagined uh, some months before, which is drop out of graduate school. I, I felt like the world seemed so out of joint. I can't just fit into the world the way it is because that would mean I'm out of joint. So, one question was, what does it make sense for me to do in this out of joint world? Um, but the other one was, went deeper into uh, sort of challenging me to come to terms with the, the greater darkness that I saw. Um, it, deeply interwoven with the dynamics of the human world. And I, I, the second thing that 1968 gave me was a, a need to understand why is the world like this? Why is there so much torment? 
why why is war such a uh, a problem that winds ugly in its ugly way all throughout human history so i i, I dropped out um, i worked in the mccarthy campaign that's eugene mccarthy not joe didn't go back that far <laughs> uh that was my parents generation to deal with um trying to stop the vietnam war i followed that to 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 um california and i became essentially a, a dropout i mean i i, I work i had some graduate work by then in, in, in clinical psychology and i managed to land an internship so i wasn't just spinning my wheels but i had no idea where i was going and i was not a happy person um and i was sort of simmering on the back of my mind the, the these two questions about um why is the world so screwed up and and uh, what does it make sense for me to do in a world that's so screwed up and all that in retrospect i could see um led to uh in 1970 uh, the summer uh to a moment where i got simultaneously an answer to both questions um why was the world so full of uh, destruction? I'll tell you that in a minute. What sense did it make? What, did, what was there that made sense for me to do? Articulate what I'd seen and convey it to my fellow human beings. So that's the introduction. That's how I got to the point where at one moment, somehow I felt like I saw something. It was an extraordinary moment in a variety of ways. Like I didn't think it was me thinking um, like usual. It was me, I, don't, I thought it was being shown something. And I don't really remember all the content of that moment. Uh, I don't remember when I started calling it the parable. Uh, uh, let me just say that I don't remember having, that there was any a uh, necessary piece missing to what I'm about to present. I don't remember if I called it the parable of the tribes already, or, or if not, how, how many days later it was that that came out. I, I don't know. But um, that moment gave me this. And uh, when I wrote it up recently, uh, when I was invited to uh, submit essays to a, a website called uh, Three Quarks Daily, uh, I, I wrote it up um, laying out a series of steps to compellingly lead people to the conclusion that I think is we're compelled to, to reach. And I, I gave it a, a Carney Barker kind of a title. I called it um, The Ugliness We See in Human History is Not Human Nature Writ Large. And um, my thought was that people would want to know if if that were true um, first of all it would be nice to know you know that we're not as ugly as we look and secondly it's kind of puzzling well how how can you prove that so anyway that was i was trying to get people into the tent and um in that piece uh, you know I, i've this is an idea which I don't know how many times I've articulated in writing and uh, on a radio interview or a university lecture, or, but this was my most recent, very disciplined effort after so many tries. It was about two thousand words, and I'll put the uh, I'll put the link up for that. But right now, I'll I'll go through the the six steps that get you to see what I saw that day, which is that civilization's out of control, you know, always had, has been, and inevitably would be. It calls attention to the crucial nature of what it means for a species to do the unprecedented thing we started doing 10,000 years ago, which is starting to invent a whole new way of life. 
that's the unprecedented thing. Uh, there, not that there, you know, this was, there was culture long before that. Um, the, but they still lived, they, even, even though they had languages and they made tools and, and, and were variously showing that they were already um, well into um, building culture into the center of their lives in a way that no other creature had ever done. But they still live basically continuously with, uh, with the ways of their um, primate ancestors. Uh, the size of the society was basically the same. The structure was basically the same. The means of subsistence of the hunter gatherers was basically the same. But then things change. And uh, they part and that point, some point, uh, some human societies start innovating, um, change, inventing uh, a different way of life. It starts with the uh, horticultural gardens. Thousands of years, handful of thousands by the, you know, uh, that has led, um, putting aside what determined how, what direction it was led, but 5,000 years later, uh, societies that were starting to pen in animals and who were starting to grow gardens, um, those, uh, where those had been, there were agricultural societies uh, of a large scale um, that um, were becoming empires. That's the, uh, a breakthrough was made of a, of a creature extricating itself from the niche in which it evolved biologically by utilizing uh, the gr greatest creative intelligence that uh, this planet had yet seen, having reached a point where they were capable of inventing a way of life. But there's a catch-22. You know, it's, it's like the tragic hero who gets um, impaled uh, by his very strength, you know, with Heracles and Euripides, uh, you know, destroying his, his own world or, um, out of a kind of madness in his case. But it is not madness here. All it took was for human beings to be creatively intelligent enough to um, make the breakthrough into inventing a, a new way of life. And then inevitable things start to happen. I mean, the word inevitable just keeps shopping, showing up. And that, that, that's connected with the word compelling, that there's uh, connected with the uh, hanging together so tightly that it holds water. So anyway, there, there, there are some inevitabilities that, um, this parable of the tribes points to the inevitability. Uh, I, I may say, you know, to, in the conclusion that we're leading to, uh, one way of putting it is: it, it is inevitable that if a species embarks on the path of civilization, what might be called the spirit of the gangster will have a disproportionate say in how that creature's civilization will develop, inevitably. So that's where the destination, here are the steps that lead inexorably to it. First of all, that definition extricates itself from the niche in which it evolved biologically. That means that the that they become the first creatures that escape from the natural order. And their advantages to that, but the natural order had certain properties that if you escape from the natural order, you lose some of those valuable properties. And, and, and the natural order, uh, a line I like to use is uh, the lion, and the zebra and the grass work together to create a perpetual motion machine. 
even as they devour each other. Now, in that book, um, back there, The Parable of Tribes, I, I put the same uh, point in, in, in some different uh, terms, uh, that when, when the wolf uh, pounces upon the lamb, I, I don't remember word for word, but when the wolf pounces upon the lamb, it is an injury, injury to the lamb, but it is not part an injury to lamb kind, said I. If, if it is part of the pattern of survival, not only for the wolves, but for the sheep as well. For if you eliminate the predator, the sheep will overgraze and pretty soon uh, they will go extinct. So that's the natural order. The interactions between all the parts uh, are regulated by the order, which was formed by a process, and this is the heart of the evolutionary process, that it continually selects for what can survive and perpetuate itself into the future over what cannot. And in terms of the what, it's not just the individual species uh, um, that are, you know, passing DNA uh, along their own track. Well, it turns out there's horizontal transfer as well. But the whole system uh, where the interactions are regulated in the service of what is viable. Uh, and what enables life to continue, uh, what, which means what meets, at least in some ways, uh, the needs of light, life. So that's evolution. That's the natural order. To leave that order means to plunge into a kind of disorder because there is nothing to regulate the interactions of these new life forms, these civilized societies, these, these first life forms that uh, are the function, have been shaped not by natural selection, but by the creative intelligence of the creature. The lack of anything to regulate it, natural or human designed, creature designed, means that they will be unregulated. And there is not going to be any creature design the way civilization emerges. They, they, they emerge in, in terms of these clusters of, of civilizing societies and, uh, and emerging in clusters. I meant they were eventually going to have to interact. And of course, as societies grow in, in size, whatever uh, their nature, eventually the, you know, the planet is finite and, and there are going to be interactions. And nothing is in place to govern those interactions, to make sure that they're life-serving in some fundamental sense. There is an inevitable disorder, and it is a disorder which deserves its own special name. And fortunately, our civilization has, uh, has given this kind of disorder a name, and that name is anarchy. Anarchy, meaning there is nothing above the actors that requires them to behave in a way which is consistent with the ongoing reasonable functioning of the whole. Anarchy, which um, exists, various people of international studies kinds of thinkers say, that the Intersocietal or international system is a system of anarchy. There's nobody to prevent Vladimir Putin to single-handedly put a continent into uh, the war mode again. That's anarchy. Nothing governs the actors. The actors act as they will. 
then comes another inevitability. Uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, who lived in an anarchic time in English history, is the great theorist about the nature of anarchy. Um, not that there are so many competing for that role. But Thomas Hobbes said, and, and, and I think uh, we got plenty of, inch of evidence in history that a state of anarchy uh, existing among a group of actions who become sort of like sovereign actors in whatever way inevitably devolves into a war of all against all. I'm not going to lay out that particular inevitability. I'm just going to say uh, I'm satisfied that that's true. I mean, we've seen it, for example, and well, I guess I'm going to lay, you know, make a case. In, in, in my lifetime, um, I, I feel well, I've been witness to two circumstances uh, of um, essentially anarchy. Uh, the breakdown of the le uh, ruling order in Lebanon in the late 70s and early 80s, and then uh, the breakdown of the nation state in, uh, in Somalia in the early 90s. And it is clear that what happens in, in anarchy um, is that there will be a war of all against all. Uh, subsequently, uh, I've seen that um, that the Europe of feudal times um, is, you know, a, a long example of, of this. Uh, I mean, if you go to Italy, you look at um, how uh, how these uh, cities have been built in the places where the last place you'd want to build them. You have to schlep these huge rocks all the way up the mountain to build a castle on top of the mountain. The worst possible place. Oh, except if the anarchy is uh, always gives rise to a war of all against all. Uh, and you've got marauding gangs. plunging the countryside and gradually setting themselves up as um, an aristocracy over the serfs. But before that, having to contend with the fact that everybody was having to deal with a war of all against all, having to protect themselves enough that it made sense to schlep those big rocks all the way up to the top of the hill in order not to be uh, overrun by gangsters. And the same thing happened in, I mean, Lebanon became a society in which there were several warlords that were contending. So did Somalia. These are not a, random cross-section of humanity. The ugliness we see in human nature is not, in human history, is not human nature writ large. If anarchy is going to lead to that kind of spirit of the gangster having a disproportionate say in ruling how things are, That's the level at which we need to look at that moment where humankind extricates itself from the niche in which it evolved biologically and plunges into uh, an anarchic situation. Not for any fault of this, not because we are such terrible creatures. I don't know how good we are, but I know we're better than the spirit of the gangster. Where, the, where some of the worst of human potentialities actually inevitably get a disproportionate say. People like Putin and, oh, we could make a whole list of human monsters who've had a, it's way too much say about what kind of world we've lived in. What kind of world would we live in if uh, there hadn't been a Hitler? If uh, 
if Mao Zedong were, had been infused with the moral spirit of Gandhi, um, if Donald Trump hadn't been this, uh, the guy who's supposed to be the leader of the free world. So there are problems that are built into the structure of things, and that's what I'm laying out. Inevitably, if a creature starts to invent its own way of life, it will plunge into an anarchic situation where there is nothing to govern how its various iterations, the various civilized societies will interact with each other. And out of there, uh, the war of all against all that is inevitable, a selection process of a sort inevitably emerges. I mean, if there's going to be a war of all against all, it's not going to be random which ones prevail in that war. No. There are certain, just like in uh, Lebanon and, uh, you know, all that, there are certain kinds of options, ways of being a human being or ways of being a human culture that increase your chances of surviving in that kind of a world. You know, what we would like to have happen is that at every turn, those cultural options that best fulfill our deepest human needs are those that get to choose what kind of future we'll have. That's what we would like. But if the rise of civilization inevitably generates a war of all against all, and I think those inevitabilities are quite sound, then the criteria for what gets to survive and spread among the, 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 the various cultural options, the criteria for what succeeds are what can prevail and survive in a war of all against all. And that is quite different from what most you meets human needs. We are not living in a world. I mean, of course, of course it is. Of course, we human beings have always done what we could within the uh, parameters that were laid upon us to make our lives meaningful. I mean, we get to choose where to put a drinking fountain. We've achieved a lot about meeting human needs. But at the same time, all of what meets human needs has had to be also be consistent with societies developing in ways that enable them to survive in an anarchic inter-societal system that was an inevitable war of all against all, in which meant that only those options that, prev that help give the uh, society that kind of power will define the human future. It's inevitable. It, uh, it, it, you know, if you imagine uh, other s creatures on other planets having to um, deal with the consequences of making that unprecedented step onto the path of civilization and unleashing a selective force that drives things in the direction of power maximization because anarchy is an inevitable consequence of the beginnings of a civilization. They all would have had to uh, uh, develop in the directions of power maximization. Any cultural option that can't prevail gets eliminated eventually. I mean, we're talking about over centuries and over millennia. It's not like an NCAA tournament uh, that eliminates the, the weaker teams. 
you know, in a mechanical kind of way. But history goes on. Things happen now, things happen then. Agricultural societies uh, displace uh, hunter and gathering societies. Industrialized societies uh, colonize agrarian societies. Something's going on. It's got to do with a struggle for power that is inevitable in a world where there's going to be a war of all against all. And it thereby enshrines those cultural options that make for the greatest amount of power of the kind that it takes to win such a war. It doesn't matter what kind of creature uh, the creature is. I mean, maybe we're aggressive more than I think. Uh, uh, you know, nature red in tooth and claw is a little bit of the, pro the, the situation. Um, but it was inevitable that whatever our potentialities were for becoming channels for the spirit of, of a gangster, those potentialities were going to get chosen for magnification, inevitably. It, it, the, the power is selected for because the anarchy is inevitable. Power inevitably spreads throughout the human system like a contaminant. And to show this aspect of um, the selection for power, uh, I, this is where the parable of the tribes thing comes from. And I, like I said, I, I don't remember when I first saw it in these terms. Um, hmm. The original moment involves uh, envisioning a, an aqueduct and water flowing through it. But uh, imagine a group of tribes all living within reach of each other. If all choose to live in peace, then all may live in peace. But imagine that all but one wants there to be peace, and that one is bent on expanding its power by predation upon its neighbors. And then I go through the various options that might befall these neighbors. Let's say there were 20 tribes to begin with. One is into power, the 19 are, are not. So what can happen to the 19? And I say there are four possible outcomes. One is that the aggressive society attacks them and exterminates them and absorbs their territory into its expanding empire. And by the way, history is full of ugliness like that. Second possibility. The aggressive tribe, uh, having uh, swallowed some neighbor, uh, powerful enough to go in and conquer another neighbor, but this time instead of, uh, um, uh, of exterminating them, they absorb them into their own power system, uh, often in the form of uh, slavery, or, or some way making them, exploiting them to serve the power of the uh, original aggressor. And, and we see that throughout history, you know, go see the Ten Commandments, you know. Sure is good when the oppressed people have the hand of God behind them, but for the most part, a lot of people have been ground down by conquerors who are, had what it takes to prevail and to take advantage of, who are essentially of a spirit that's appropriate for a world in which there's going to be a war of all against all. So that's the second option. Then the third option is somebody, the, the group sees what's happening to its neighbors, the ones that were exterminated, the ones that were enslaved. And it decides, we can't, we don't want to go have that happen to us. We can't uh, deal with that threat. Um, 
let's leave here. Let's go off into some remote place uh, above the Arctic Circle or, uh, um, or, or in the Amazonian jungle or something like that. And uh, maintain ourselves as we are, as, a, as a, you know, the cultural choices that we've made, but uh, leave our own homeland behind uh, to do that. Okay, uh, and then there's a, a fourth option, which uh, is the one that we, we mainly see in, in our times. Um, societies uh, seeing themselves threatened by power um, decide that um, they gotta be able to defend themselves against that aggressive power. And um, so they develop um, that kind of power too, it's sufficient to protect themselves from the fates of, uh, uh, of the exterminated or the exploited or of the um, gone from the scene. So self-defense looks like, oh, okay, well, we, that's, I guess that solves our, that problem not from a social evolutionary uh, perspective of the parable of the tribe. It doesn't solve the problem. It, it's just another form of the problem. Uh, it, it, even though there are four different options for the um, individual uh, civilizing societies that are threatened, uh, from the point of view of the system as a whole, the outcome is the same in every respect with each option. In all four options, the ways of power are spread through this whole system. What had begun as just one little contaminant among 20 total pieces, gradually spreads by incorporating the territories of the, uh, of the um, uh, exterminated or uh, absorbing the territories uh, and exploiting the people and transforming their cultures in whatever ways they can that are also uh, uh, power maximizing for the conqueror um, uh, or uh, running a, um, uh, a way to uh, some place that's not in the system that we started with at all uh, or uh, the ones that stay put and say we are going to defend ourselves but in order to defend themselves you know they've got they've got to develop power. And if the power that threatens them has become great by means of some kind of cultural innovation, if they've tapped into some new source of power the, of the kind you want so you can prevail in the war of all against all, in order to defend themselves against that power, they've got to in some fundamental ways at least, emulate that threatening power. Uh, like uh, there's a line I've always liked uh, um, having to do with how Japan, um, seeing what was happening to its neighbors in Asia at the hands of the European imperialists, uh, thought it's either industrialized or be gobbled up like the rest. And, and, and the Japanese made themselves uh, into a European level power, uh, big enough to beat the Russians in 1905 and big enough to give the United States a, a substantial painful run for their money in, uh, in World War II. So transform yourself to become like what's threatening you or be gobbled up like the rest. So all four ways, you start with one, one uh, contaminant and you end up with the whole system being shaped by the requirements of power maximization, the selection for power. And the selection for power you know, is another way of talking about the spirit of the gangster. You know, the, when there's a struggle for power, a war of all against all, it's something like the spirit of the gangster that you can count on to, you know, to, to gain control, 
to have the disproportionate say. So that's, that's the inevitable result of a creature stepping onto the path of civilization. There's no way you can blame our, our species for um, not foreseeing it. Hell, we don't, for, you know, this idea I put out there um, in 1984 that just got ignored um, after making a bit of a splash, we, we don't see still what's happened to us. It wasn't because of a, a, the nature of, a, of us as a human be, of human beings that the spirit of gangster uh, became the face of our civilization. That would happen to any creature that steps onto that path on any other planet in the cosmos. I think that the whole step-by-step -step link is so inescapable. Qualifications here and there, yeah, sure, sure. But basically, any creature that steps onto the path of civilization is gonna have to deal with the, with the, uh, the conditions of anarchy that give rise to a selective process that favor the ways of power that spread throughout the whole system because the, there is a need for a, a, the creature not just to break through into civilization, but to bring those forces under control. Because civilization inevitably emerges and plunges out of control from the beginning until that creature brings those forces under control and then gets to choose what kind of human world there's going to be. And that really matters because, well, I've said it in the previous one too, about my gut feeling about uh, that in the not so, in the coming not so many generations, humankind's either going to get its act together to survive for the long haul, or we're actually going to basically fail in our experiment with civilization and destroy ourselves, or at least inflict on ourselves a profound catastrophe. I think that basically we're at the point where we're going to go one way or the other. And so it is important for us to understand where we are in the evolutionary process and where we need to get to. We're in the process still of being driven by a civilization that's out of control, in, in which the role of power is, is out of control, as it inevitably would be from the beginnings of anybody's civilization. But that power just keeps on getting greater. It's just in living memory that we, as a species, have been aware that we have the capacity to destroy ourselves. It's not just that we haven't become aware of it, that we've actually seen that we do. We, we didn't, you know, back in medieval times, we, we, we could do some damage here and there. And we did that. We've done, civilization has done damage to the environment. And there have been slaughters and ugly things uh, throughout history. But never till beginnings of atomic weapons of mass destruction have we as a species had to look at the, uh, the fact that we now possessed command of a power that could annihilate ourselves. Um, and, and we've been doing ecological damage, you know, forever uh, at a, at a scale that doesn't, that didn't constitute the possible comprehensive catastrophe that something like climate change might imply. So this is something new that we have 
happened uh, upon. We're, we're having to confront an issue which wasn't visible in previous generations, which is that if you're going to step onto the path of civilization and then you unleash uh, a cultural evolutionary process of which the selection for power is just one. I mean, there's also the expansion of knowledge and you know, all, all, all kinds of things that are going on, but one of them is the selection for uh, uh, for power. And as people's creativity uh, leads to ever more knowledge and, uh, and ever more invention, uh, culture is cumulative. And it's pretty much inevitable that once a creature embarks upon um, the evolutionary process of civilization, um, its powers are going to generally grow over time. Um, you know, there are, there are times of collapse, like, you know, the Dark Ages or something like that. But basically, uh, um, you go from uh, uh, hunting, gathering to agriculture to, you know, the Industrial Revolution, you know, it's increasing power. Um, and, and there's no reason why that should stop because uh, people keep on creating things and keep on trying to find the powers to be able to meet uh, their needs or desires. And it's just going to keep on growing, you know. Um, you're going to get science that tells you about the power that's in, contained in the atom. You're going to get the science that tells you how to harness electricity. Things are going to change. And the way they do change is preordained to be what does well in a continual struggle for power. So any creature that is cultural enough to invent civilization is going to have a lot of plasticity. I mean, there, you and I, I mean, I was born to, into a world where English is spoken. So I speak English. I'm imagining that most of you are in the same boat. But if we had been born in China, it would be, we say, Mandarin Chinese that we grow up speaking. We are just as ready to do that. And likewise, every human being is born ready to be a member of whatever culture is born into. And, and, and once you get, you know, the kind of variety that culture implies, and then even, the even greater variety that civilization represents, you can see that there's going to be a huge diversity of possibilities. There's going to be all kinds of ways of being that are in the cultural mix. Different people invent their cultures and they, and they live through their own historical processes and they develop this particular, if they were in isolation, they probably, you know, you can imagine what kind of a huge variety there would be if every society had been sort of like an island and it just was able to develop according to its own internal cultural processes and people making choices and how all that interacts. But that's not what happens. Not when there's a war of all against all. You get a whole wide range of cultural possibilities. You know, uh, whatever, you, the, the, what the anthropologists say, I guess, about, uh, I don't know, pre-modern world, uh, like 1,200 different cultural possibilities out there. 
Anyway, but it's been narrowing continually. You know, how many languages? Continually narrowing. That's sort of metaphorical for the convergence of cultures. But anyway, there's a whole big variety out there from, from the beginning. And then there are the struggles for power out of which some emerge in victorious and having great say and others having to live with whatever the consequences are of not having prevailed in the war of all against all. So we look at the world and we see not what human beings would have chosen. People are always making choices. Those choices are not trivial. But the context within which they choiced, chose was not something that they chose, but they couldn't avoid it. As soon as you leave the natural order, the creature that steps out of that, makes that unprecedented step. And this is what I'm calling the fateful step. When we step out of the natural order into anarchy, we unleash something that's going to drive our civilization in a direction that we would not have chosen and that does not reflect our nature because the selection for power has been able to get whatever it wanted out of us in its quest for power maximization to dominate. Now, I just personified the force. I don't believe in the personification of the force. This thing actually does act a whole lot like evil in a very subtle kind of way, the way it ramifies through the whole human world. I'll get into that in another talk. But this thing is basically a systemic dynamic. It is an inevitable systemic dynamic if when a creature emerges out of the biologically evolved system into a system that's shaped by the inventiveness of a creature. It unleashes forces that that creature cannot, does not control and will not until it sees that force and its ramifications and fights it more effectively, or at least until it carries the ordering process far enough, fast enough, that humankind can exist as a civilized species on this planet for the long haul. And it can escape the dangers we now face of self-destruction. I hope that you'll join me for looking at more of how this better human story puts us in a better light, clarifies our situation better, and gives some guidance about what we've got to do if we're going to win this race for survival, to defeat human destruction, self-destruction, in the total story of our species. That our species could succeed in facing the central challenge of any civilization creating creature. That challenge being to order its civilization well enough and soon enough to avoid self-destruction. Please join me again as I try to show what I've spent my life discovering. Thank you. I appreciate your listening.